Welcome to another tutorial video. In this one, we're going to be discussing quarterly financial projections, how they're different from annual projections, and why we tend not to use them all the time in financial models. Here's the question that came in the other day. Why do most of your financial models use annual projections rather than quarterly, half year, or monthly ones? And how are quarterly projections different? How much of the setup changes? So before I answer this, I just want to clarify one quick point. We do actually have several half year and quarterly models and even some monthly models and case studies in our courses. But yes, it is true that many of our case studies, especially the introductory level ones, do use annual numbers. And there are basically two reasons for that. I'm going to give you the short answer and explanation here, and then we're going to go into a longer explanation and look at how quarterly projections differ after this. So reason number one that we tend to focus on annual projections is that quarterly, half year, or monthly projections create a lot of extra work for relatively little added benefit in most cases. You have to project twice as many or four times as many or 12 times as many numbers, but you're not going to get twice as much or four times as much or 12 times as much in benefit if you actually go through all the work and do that. Also, reason number two on a more practical level is that it's hard to show quarterly projections on screen, especially if we have, say, a four, five, or six-year model, whereas it's quite easy to show five to 10 years in an annual projection model on screen. To show you an example of what I mean by this, I have up here a quarterly model for Avianca, a Colombian airline company in one of our courses. And to go over the span of just around three or four years here, we have four quarters, so we have to scroll over all the way over here, and that gets us to about four or five years later. Whereas if we were just looking at annual numbers, for example, in our annual summary over here, we wouldn't even have to move the screen at all. We could just keep the same area on screen and just enter all our numbers here. The result is that it's much easier for you to follow that and also for us to teach it and demonstrate it on screen. Now, with this said, there are some cases in which quarterly projections can be useful. For example, if there's an M&A deal or a leveraged buyout deal that closes midway through the year, it's good to have projections up to the point at which it closes and then also from the transaction close to the end of the year. Also, quarterly projections are useful for highly seasonal companies that need to be stress tested. So if you have a consumer retail company that always has a strong Q4 at the end of the year for the holidays and then a weak Q1 or Q2, and you want to see how its performance holds up in those weaker quarters, quarterly projections are useful for that. And then finally, if you have a highly leveraged or distressed company that is running low on cash and may need additional financing ASAP, each quarter matters and each quarter matters even more because covenants, the requirements the company has to comply with on its debt are often tested on a monthly or quarterly basis. Now, just to go into a bit more detail on the lack of benefits with quarterly projections, if you think about something like a valuation or DCF analysis, if you project out 10 years or even 20 years, you're not going to use quarterly figures for that long. If you look at something like our Snapchat valuation, for example, we go around 20 years into the future here, and no one in their right mind is going to create quarterly projections for 20 years in a model. At most, you might create quarterly projections for the first year or two, but then even with those, you're going to have to sum up everything and get to your annual cash flow because a DCF is always based on a company's annual cash flow and the present value of that cash flow. So even if you do have quarterly numbers, you're going to have to roll them up or convert them into annual numbers anyway. In M&A and merger models, accretion dilution is based on full years and other analyses like IRR and contribution analysis are also based on full years. Now, if a deal closes midway through the year, quarterly numbers can be useful for showing the performance in that combined stub period or partial period and getting the exact balance sheet at close. For example, in one of our case studies on this deal between Suntory and Beam, a Japanese company acquiring a US company, the deal closes in Q2 of one year. And so it's helpful to have quarterly projections here because we can look at the acquirer before the deal close and then the combined company from Q3 of that year onward to the end. And we get a much easier way to combine the balance sheet since we have the Q2 numbers for both companies here. We just adjust them and then use quarterly numbers going forward for the balance sheet. And then in leverage buyouts, 
you're pretty much always going to use annual numbers. You might have a stub period in the beginning of a few months or a quarter or a few quarters if the deal closes midway through the year, but beyond that, you're always going to switch to annual numbers. Now let's go into part two and look at some of the key differences in quarterly projections, when they could actually be useful, and how you have to set up the model a bit differently. A good use case for quarterly projections is when a company is both highly leveraged and seasonal at the same time. Many airlines fall into this category. A lot of consumer and retail companies would also fall into this category. And we're analyzing the company not to value it, but because we want to assess its ability to service its existing debt and possibly to raise more debt in the future. Now, the problem with this scenario is that if we just stuck to annual numbers, we wouldn't be getting an accurate picture of the company because the covenants. So if a company has a required debt to EBITDA ratio or required EBITDA to interest ratio, these covenants are tested each month or each quarter or sometimes even each week. So we need to come up with something a bit more detailed. The problem is that a company with the same debt load or approximately the same debt over the course of a year is going to pay roughly the same interest each quarter. But in Q1 or Q2 for a retailer, let's say, revenue is going to be lower because of seasonality and revenue is going to be higher in Q4. So in Q1 and Q2, the weaker ones, the company's debt to EBITDA or EBITDA to interest, for example, might be below the minimum or above the maximum. And that could create problems for us, even if those problems don't show up in an annual model. So in this case, if we're evaluating a company like Avianca, the Colombian airline company that I showed you before, it actually helps us a lot to create a simple quarterly cash flow projection, see if the numbers work. And if the numbers don't work, don't spend more time creating an even more detailed projection, rethink your assumptions, try again, or move on to a different company or different scenario. Here are the major differences as shown in this quarterly model for Avianca. And I'll also bring up a few other examples from other quarterly and half year models throughout our courses. First off, when you project a company's revenue and expenses on a quarterly basis and use growth rates, you need to use year over year figures for the growth rates and also make sure that you use quarterly figures for the units sold, the pricing and the usage rates. The reason is that businesses are seasonal, which is the whole reason why we're creating quarterly projections in the first place. So if we look at Q4 of this year, we should compare it to Q4 of last year to get the growth rate. We shouldn't be comparing it to Q3 of this year. That defeats the whole purpose of creating this type of model. With Avianca, for example, if you look at how we're getting the growth rate for the available seat kilometers, which is basically a metric for the total amount of flights or total amount of routes the airline flies in a given time period, we are taking Q2 of 2015 and comparing it to Q2 of 2014. We are not comparing it to Q1 of 2015 because we want the year over year numbers. If you look at something like the load factor, look at how it's always higher in Q3 of each year, which makes sense because that's the summer and that's when most people travel. So because of these types of seasonal differences, we need to be very careful with using the correct quarterly numbers and the year over year growth rates if we're projecting based on growth rates. On the balance sheet, if you have balance sheet items that are linked to income statement line items, so if you link receivables to revenue, payables to operating expenses, inventory to cost of goods sold, for example, you should be linking to the LTM income statement numbers. The reason is that the past 12 months influence these items. It's not just the past quarter. If you just stick to the past quarter, you are not going to get good trends and you'll often get numbers that jump around a lot. For example, we have another model for a different airline company, EasyJet, a discount carrier based in the UK. When we project an item like trade and other receivables, basically accounts receivable, we do it based on the company's LTM revenue. So we go down and we take trade and other receivables from the end of the first half of their 2014 fiscal year. And then we compare that to the second half of 2013 going into the first half of 2014, and we get our percentages like that. If we just use the first half of 2014, we'd be getting a misleading picture because many of these receivables are longer term and may stick around for more than 90 days. And then with the other items, especially with these longer term operational items, it's the same story. You want to be reflecting the longer term trends in the company's business. Another difference is that when you have items like debt 
and cash and the interest income and interest expense, you have to divide interest rates by four in quarterly models to get the quarterly numbers. If there are principal repayments, you have to make sure you divide those properly as well. So in Avianca, for example, if we go to the debt schedule for the company, if you look at the interest expense calculations here, we take the interest rate times the debt balance, and then we divide it by four at the end because we want the number for just this quarter, not the entire year. And then even for something like the principal repayments, on the aircraft loans, they have a 10% annual principal repayment. So we have to divide that by four to get the proper number for this quarter, which is 2.5. With the credit stats and ratios and other metrics, if you mix the balance sheet and income statement numbers, then you need to be using the LTM income statement numbers rather than the quarterly ones for pretty much the same reasons that you have to project balance sheet items based on LTM income statement numbers because the balance sheet gives you a snapshot and it's influenced by all the previous history. Also, a lot of these covenants are based on LTM figures, not the quarterly figures. So for example, when we look at some of these for Avianca, we're always taking the company's LTM, EBITDA, and EBITDA. So we are going up directly to the company's income statement or cash flow projections, and we're taking the previous four quarters and we're adding up EBITDA for those quarters to get the LTM figure. And then when we look at something like total debt to EBITDA, we're taking that LTM EBITDA figure and we are comparing it to their debt which is a snapshot at a point in time on the balance sheet. Now, if it's a metric like the debt to equity ratio, those are both from the balance sheet, both the numerator and denominator come from the balance sheet. So you can use the quarterly balance sheet numbers there. It's an apples to apples comparison. So it's fine to use the quarterly numbers there. And then the final difference is that at the end of a quarterly model, you have to create a more readable annual summary. That's trickier than it sounds because in some cases you can just sum up everything and use a sum if function based on the year that you're matching. So with this Avianca model, for example, if we look at something like the available seat kilometers in a given year, we use a sum if function and we match our year at the top to our years for each quarter. And then we just add up all the appropriate quarterly figures. So that's pretty easy. But for balance sheet light items, you can't do that because the balance sheet always shows a snapshot in time. So you need to link to the Q4 number. Index and match tends to be better for that. And then some metrics you can't really link or add up at all because you have to recalculate them. The load factor is a good example. If we look at the load factor for Avianca for the annual numbers, we are recalculating it. The reason is that the load factor in the individual quarters is based on a numerator and denominator that change in each quarter. So it doesn't really make sense to use an average or a weighted average or to add up the numbers or anything like that. Instead, we need to sum up the individual components, what's in the numerator and denominator, and then recalculate it on an annual basis at the end. So this whole process is a bit trickier than you might think. Let's do a quick recap and summary now. Quarterly projections can be useful in some scenarios, but they create four times as many numbers in Excel and in most cases, they're not gonna give you four times as much benefit. They're most useful for deals that close midway through the year, highly seasonal companies, and also highly leveraged and distressed companies. The main differences are that you need to use year-over-year -year growth rates and the properly quarterly units and pricing if you're projecting revenue expenses like that. You need to link balance sheet line items to the LTM income statement numbers. With interest, make sure you divide by four or by two in a half year model or by 12 in a monthly model. You need to pair the balance sheet numbers in key metrics and ratios with the LTM income statement numbers. And then at the end, you need to create an annual roll up and summary that makes everything easier to read and interpret. Now, the ultimate irony here is that this quarterly model ends up not making a difference for Avianca because if you go down to where we actually test all the covenants here, the company pretty much violates the EBITDA to total debt service plus rent covenant in every single quarter of this model. So this is a pretty blatant violation and we probably could have detected it even with an annual model. And then the other covenants, the company is in perfect compliance with. So in this particular case, the quarterly model doesn't make that much of a difference, but it could have made a bigger difference. And that's why you create quarterly projections and financial models in some cases.